matter what hour your clock strikes here, it's always Halloween. And I am always your haunted host, Luce Tomlin Brenner. Today we have a special episode for you due to technical difficulties. Um, I am releasing a story that was previously released only on Patreon last March called Grimalkin by Andrew F. Sullivan. This wonderfully disturbing tale of crones and the draining effects of family was first published in the fantastic little horror anthology called Tiny Nightmares, which was published in 2020. I love this book. Tiny Nightmares is one of the best collections of modern horror. There is stuff that ranges from creatures to ghosts to psychos to environmental disasters to body horror to romance. A little bit of everything for everyone and very bite-sized stories that you can read on a break from work or on the subway or just when you need to clear your mind of all the other shenanigans that are swirling around you. So if you need the perfect winter ween book to spook up your spirits, please check out Tiny Nightmares. I just love it. And a thank you to my friend Jen Curcio who got it for me as a gift. It has brought me lots of uh, cold-blooded terror slash joy. So I am releasing this story today because originally slated for today is a special interview episode with Annie Rose Malamit of Girls, Guts, and Giallo, one of my all-time favorite podcasts. She's a Ghoul Gang member. She's a fan of the show. She loves to celebrate Halloween, and we're working on a larger episode together for later this year about how queer culture has influenced modern day celebrations of Halloween. But before all that, she and I have been working on an episode about the 1973 Italian horror film Baba Yaga. This film is not even really a cult classic yet in America. I have not heard that many people talking about it. Annie introduced it to me and now I'm obsessed with it. And it is a wonderful little horror film about witches. It's a different take on the Baba Yaga mythology, and I talk a little bit about that. But this episode just had some issues coming together, and I needed to have a couple more days to finish working on it. So we will be releasing the Annie Rose Malamit episode about the Baba Yaga myth and the Baba Yaga film next week. Friday, January 27th. So you have that to look forward to. And in the meantime, please enjoy this witchy tale. If you would like more ghost stories, then please subscribe on Patreon where you can get two a month. Now you can also subscribe on Spotify. And I'm setting up the Apple subscriptions. There was some issue with my account. I can't figure it out. I'm in the middle of figuring it out. It's just taking longer to set up than I thought it would. Ah, everything always takes longer than you think it's going to. The actual haunting experiences of being an adult. I want there to be more ghosts, but all of the ghosts are just terms and conditions sheets I needed to read closer. Ugh, being haunted by bureaucracy. Now, before we jump into the story, I want to thank the Patreon Ghoul Gang who helps us produce each and every episode and welcome our newest Ghoul Gang member, Alicia. Hello, and thank you for supporting the podcast. When you become a patron of It's Always Halloween, you are giving money to a completely DIY operation helmed by queer artists in Los Angeles, making their way without the support of networks or corporations. Plus, you get to be a part of a fun community. And this weekend, one of the exciting community things we are doing is screening Clue, from 1985, which has been a Lantern favorite since I started the podcast. I have heard from so many of you who love this movie. 
And patrons voted that this was the movie they wanted to watch the most together. So this Saturday, we are watching Clue at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. There'll be a discussion and a pre-roll video show and a chat that goes on throughout the film. And then the following week on Sunday, January 29th, we are screening Phantom of the Paradise, which Emma Cogan discussed on her episode about Halloween costumes and how inspirational that film has been to her work in horror and to her cosplay experiences as well. So Emma is going to jump on that screening with me from Portland and watch Phantom of Paradise with the Ghoul Gang. So I hope you can join us for some movie screenings this month or read Practical Magic by Alice Hoffman with us. That's our book club pick this month and we're meeting on January 31st to discuss it and then we'll be watching Practical Magic after we talk about the book that same night. So a lot of fun things going on this month. Join us for more at patreon.com slash it's always Halloween. And big thanks to every ghoul who helps us stay ad-free, independent, and sustainable. Now, make sure your windows are closed tight. You wouldn't want any stray creatures crawling through them in the night, now would you? This is Grimalkin by Andrew F. Sullivan. The kitten climbs up and out of my sister's mouth in the middle of the night, emerging as one long strand of hair and bone. I watch as it draws a wet tail past her lips and then drops to the floor, stretching out on the ragged red carpet between our twin beds. Most nights, I'm asleep before this happens. I don't hear the kitten scratching at the bedposts. I don't notice her leaping up onto the sill, tracking the moon with pale yellow eyes. Tonight, I watch her body flatten out, slipping through the cracked window we leave open for her no matter the season. I listen to her, waiting for a voice to whisper back at me, Go to sleep. She is hunting, searching for sustenance before the sun comes out again. I don't speak a word. I know the rules. Grandma hates to be interrupted. The promise was to keep her safe. After they found her circle in the basement, Grandma knew her days were numbered in this town. Our mother claimed ignorance and disbelief. She joined the chorus of voices calling for her head. Our father sealed himself away in his room, the television drowning out any thought of his mother, her life threatened by familiar faces and strangers alike whenever she left the house. Her car was set on fire. It burned for hours. No one put it out. We were told not to visit, not to speak, not to smile. We were told to be afraid. She came to us in the middle of the night, her form new and unpolished. The tail ended in a ball of gluey fur. The ears were shaped like raw bat wings, pink and pulsing with tiny veins. You can save me, she said. You can protect me. My sister and I stared, each tucked into bed, quivering beneath the covers. Only you can do this, she said. Her voice was bigger than her shape. Do this, she said in the growing darkness. Do this and I will show you everything. Grandma had no daughter of her own. She told us she was not blessed. Grandpa cared only about amassing things, money, property, power. All three one and the same eventually, Grandma said. She was cursed to have one son and only one son, a boy spoiled by his father, a boy unable to understand his place in the world, as everywhere he went, he was placed upon a pedestal, a shiftless and ungrateful boy who let his father's empire of car dealerships and repair shops fall into dust 
while barely flinching in the process. This explained our shared room, our twin beds, our rotten red carpet that felt wet even when it was dry in the morning. Our birth offered her a new chance to pass on what her mother had taught her, old ways of power, old ways of knowing the world. Sometimes they required blood, and sometimes they required flame, but they were true and honest. They did not take without reason. They demanded sacrifice, but the demands were proportionate. The balance was retained. The balance was essential. We offer a balance, my sister and I, two strands of the same soul spun into mirrored shapes, spun into soft and malleable flesh. We could push these powers further. We could become more. I waited my whole life for you two, Grandma said, and now they want to take me from you. When she returns, I stare at the ceiling. After she is fed on mice or birds or smaller things, her body bloats like a tumor. Her hunger is constant and inevitable. Without her nightly feed, she cannot live like this, tucked deep inside our chests, keeping time against our hearts. We take turns, alternated month to month as the moon shifts and the tides change. My turn is coming again. I will dream behind her eyes as she stalks the night, listening for her prey, hunting the weak, the stupid, and the maimed. I will dream in red and pink and white, white bone. Before climbing back into my sister's chest, she leaves small bones from her kill for us on the carpet. We will grind those bones into a powder, a powder the keeper will swirl into a glass of water before bed, the spell requiring our participation, our ingestion of the dead. We tell our mother it is for our bowel movements, and she approves. She wants us to be regular. I stare at the ceiling and listen to the sound of Grandma sliding back down my sister's throat. Tomorrow, a new cycle begins. I can already taste the dead in my mouth, the particles clinging to the back of my throat like sand. Tomorrow, I must become the keeper once again. The spells are small and easy. They are more like charms and incantations, a burst of energy in the mornings after we set the charred sticks in the correct configuration, burn the right herbs in the backyard, telling our father it's for chemistry class. Our memories improve together, our recall for formulas and history transforming our test scores. Sometimes we get answers wrong on purpose just to protect us from suspicion. Grandma says, like any gambler, we must know when to walk away, when to make a mistake that everyone can see. We must sow doubt if we want to reap her rewards. We must seem human. We must be plausible. I watch my sister growing tired as the months pass, see her fading every time her month arrives, the burden in her chest drying out her skin, puckering the corners of her eyes. Grandma says it's the stress of keeping a secret, the wear and tear of the lie working itself across our bodies. She says what we're doing is beautiful, and necessary, sacred even. When I find my sister puking in the grass behind our school, Grandma says we should be grateful she has chosen us. Tonight, I take the powder, swirl it around the glass. I stand before the mirror and then watch myself raise the glass to my lips, watch myself pause, and then pour it all down the drain. My sister is already asleep in the other room, worn out by her month incubating grandma. 
the role of the keeper is not easy. It takes and takes and takes. The deal we have made is not proportionate. We can feel the years slipping away, the time passing us by, the time she is taking until she can seize one of us. We talk about this in whispers, wondering if she can hear from within our chests her long pink ears pressed against our ribs on alert for any betrayal. I shut the door and lie down in bed. I leave the window cracked open. I close my eyes and wait for sleep to come. There is no death lingering at the back of my throat, no tiny bits of bone floating in my stomach acid. Grandma will have to fight her way out from the inside of me tonight, each claw a pin pressed into my lungs. I intend to keep her there until she starves. I hope that sweet and short little chiller gives you a reason to stay up late tonight laying in your beds, maybe just seeing something out of the corner of your eye as you're about to fall asleep. Lanterns, do you have any scary stories of your own to share? Please call the All Hallows hotline at 802-532-DEAD or write us an eek mail at it's always Halloween podcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear about freaky cats and your connection to Baba Yaga or witches or of course just your wonderful Halloween memories. Give us a call, write us that eek mail, and you could be featured on an upcoming Small Frights episode. As I said at the top, if you love It's Always Halloween, please help us stay independent, ad-free, and sustainable by becoming a podcast patron. Visit patreon.com slash it's always Halloween to pick your level of monthly or annual support. You can also sponsor an episode for yourself, your business, or a loved one for $30 using our tip jar. Find links to both Patreon and our tip jar in the show notes. You can also support the podcast by buying the Lantern's Way zine from Displaced Snail or snagging It's Always Halloween merch from our Redbubble. Those links are in our show notes as well. This episode of It's Always Halloween was performed by me, your forever haunted host, Luce Tomlin Brenner. I read the incredibly disturbing short story Grimalkin by Andrew F. Sullivan, first published in the book Tiny Nightmares in 2020. This episode was co-produced by the incredible Pete Burns, who also wrote our fantastic theme music. Thanks, Pete. Make sure to check out Pete's new album, Her April, now on Spotify under his artist name, P.B., you can follow the show on Instagram at It's Always Halloween Podcast, me on Instagram and Twitter at LTB Comedy, and Pete at Mittenberries. If you're on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe and write us a little review so that other like minded ghouls can find us. We're also on the NPR One app, so subscribe there and tell Ira Glass you love us. Thanks so much for listening to yet another episode of It's Always Halloween, and come back next time. Unless a cat's got your tongue, your throat, your lungs, your lungs.